Well, thank the Lord. God bless everyone in Jesus' name. And I thank the Lord for his presence. Bless the Lord on high. Just grateful for all the things that we have to be thankful for this day in the Lord. And uh, today, certainly, we want to make mention, and God bless our brethren at the Chicago Tabernacle at Aurora Branch, of which I had opportunity to witness to them this past Thursday there with uh, Brother Gabriel and congregation. And it was a, a wonderful service. If you haven't had a chance to sample it on, uh, on YouTube, I hope you get a, a chance to see that. But, you know, just a real positive uh, spirit of worship there amongst our yeah. brethren. And, you, you know, I've had many people tell me, I think even Brother Joe and Brother Jim, who went along, of course, uh, were talking about it, you know. There's a lot of times where you don't want to be the pastor because there are just a lot of things that come up, you know, and in life and, and the things you have to, uh, to get through and, and it does take a lot of effort and there's a lot of work that just goes into sermons and, and uh, so forth. But I'll tell you, one time where you would have loved to have been a pastor was yeah. Thursday night in, in Aurora there to, to speak to people and you're proclaiming the core beliefs that we have had and we've carried with us all these years and to hear people saying amen to all those things, amen. that's where you'd want to be me <laughs> at, at, at a moment like that. But, you know, thank God we can partake of that, you know, through uh, sharing the service and uh, in the personal contacts that we will have with uh, Brother Gabriel's congregation there. And, and it was just tremendous, you know. Uh, these are our people. And, yeah. and uh, even though I know that you haven't met them yet and, and all these things, or, or a few have had just uh, some brief contact, as uh, Brother Joe and Brother Jim did. Uh, these are our people. They're people of faith. So yeah. it's just a tremendous time. And for, you know, if anybody thought, you know, well, Pine Creek's winding down, you know what? I think we're just starting to rev up <laughs> in, in, in Jesus' name. So we've got a lot to look forward to. There's a lot to be glad for. So we just uh, pray for our brethren there, as well as at Full Gospel Tabernacle in Bloomington. And it's bigger than, it's bigger than even that. You know, I've been trying to give people a sense of those things because uh, there, there's a worldwide aspect to this. Yeah. And uh, there are believers and, and saints out there who I'm not even aware of. I don't even know how big this is. God knows how big this Amen. is. But, but it's, a, it's a fulfillment of all the things that we've looked forward to and held on to for low these many years so i just thank the lord for the foundations we have and moving ahead within those things and, and as we turn to matters of uh, prayer and uh, for requests again uh, try your best to get your requests in to me you know before service i'm not going to ask for prayer requests but if somebody has an uh, immediate need something to be brought up and they raise their hand i will recognize them because i know that Sometimes things come up late and, and you can't always be here right on the on the spot and so forth uh, But do the best you can to, to tell them one of the brothers or, or one of the sisters can relay the uh, Prayer request here on the podium, you know where brother Ryan's old ears can kind of pick it up better You know, uh, that's always an avenue available because we we do want to take our prayer requests and make them known unto God but the things that I am aware of uh, from Sister Rachel, this comes from a, a childhood friend for Lindsay Monogold and her family. It's very tragic. It's one of the reasons that we keep prayed up in Jesus' name because you don't know what you might face tomorrow. Uh, but she lost her husband in a, a car accident. And there's family involved, three kids. I, I don't know the ages, but uh, nonetheless, that's a, it's a very obviously a very poignant time. So uh, matters of life and death there with the Lord. So just stay prayed up, stay buckled up. You know, just the practical things you can do to make yourself safe. Uh, but stay prayed up in, in Jesus' name. And so we pray for uh, the, the Monogold family and, and all those concerned. And also a prayer request that was relayed to me from this morning comes from Sister Beta. This is for Fred, uh, Brother H Freddie Hatfield Jr., and family, which is, there's a viral condition within the family. And from the, just the, the details that I'm aware of, don't know all chapter and verse about it. 
but it, uh, there are symptoms and it appears to be on the serious side. So uh, again, these are things that we pray to pray up about. about. And concerning uh, the viral condition <clears throat> that we've been dealing with for the last you know, year and a half, and uh, the way things are now, you know, these are things that uh, I wish as a pastor I never had to speak to. But it's the signs of the times that we live in. Is it Matthew 24? In all, <clears throat> in all reality, uh, the leading edges of it, I, I don't have the answer to that question. But it sure makes you to be reminded of those things that Jesus spoke about. And one of the dangers is how we treat this. It isn't just the illness itself, but it has such potential to divide us uh, because of different ways that people right. feel about it. And just by saying that, you know, just to make people aware, I pray it does some good in however people go about with their own lives and making their own decisions. Uh, it's a, a hard thing to undergo and, and to deal with. Uh, from my position as pastor, this is one of the times where you don't want to be me, is dealing with issues like this. Uh, but I've tried to keep us on a steady course, a middle course, and not place guilt upon those who do get vaccinated or place guilt upon those who don't get vaccinated. But I, I'll tell you just by example, without doing those things, you make the best decision for yourself, always walk by faith. I don't tell people to do or not to do either one of those things. For my own self, if you wanna go by my example, I chose to go ahead and take the shot myself and I've proceeded accordingly. So that's what I personally have done. So if that helps anybody decide in what way you approach things, uh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Yeah. If you choose another course of action, blessed be the name of the Lord. But we have to get through these things together, amen? Yes, amen. Even if the devil buzzes us with a, <laughs> with a crop duster every, every once in a while. Um, people watching this on, on the upload wonder, what in the heck is he talking about? There, there's airplane noise going over the church back and forth. All right. But how, however, how we treat these things and how we treat our brethren in the midst of all these things, it's a, it's a very uh, serious condition. So I just pray you make the best decisions for those things. And we'll get all these things uh, you know, in order in, in our house as best we can. If we have to reinstitute some precautionary measures here, we'll have to do those things. You know, right now we don't have each of the pews roped off or for every other pew or, or, or so forth. But whatever precautions anyone takes, yeah. uh, I'm for that. that that's fine. So uh, it, it's up to each and every person there, and we'll just try to deal with things uh, accordingly. But it, it is serious, and, and well, we should give our most earnest prayers for the Hatfield family that they come out of it. Again, I don't know the extent of all these things, but it's something we have to be aware of. It's just, yeah. it's the day and age we live in. We have to deal with it. Yeah. So uh, we're going to do that. Yeah. In other matters of prayer, uh, in Brother Bill's family for Colin, uh, in matters of, of school and focus and development, we just pray the Lord be with uh, Colin. Obviously, it's a very difficult situation, but just the, uh, for those things necessary for uh, his, his growth and, and for the peace within the family. We've been praying along with Brother Jim for uh, some back issues and so forth. Uh, from Full Gospel Tabernacle, uh, I've had prayer requests for Brother Kelvin in, in a couple of past services, but I just want to mention that again today because that's upcoming on Tuesday, uh, the third of the month, today's the first, uh, where he has to undergo some treatment, uh, shall we call it, for uh, his condition, so uh, we're earnestly praying for Brother Thank Kelvin, Lord, there. Uh, precious brother, uh, yeah. he's quiet in his deliberations, but very thoughtful. As a matter of fact, some of the things that I talked about uh, when we were down there at Full Gospel Tabernacle uh, in, at the end of May uh, influenced the service that I have for today. So uh, we just. Pray the Lord that he'll be with Brother Kelvin and all the faithful in yeah. Bloomington there. Amen. Thank the Lord. So as we think of these things and we think on the name of the Lord, let's just 
bow our heads and pray out in Jesus' name. Father, we do thank you, Lord, for being with us. Lord, be with us wherever it is that we go. Father, even as your light enfolds around us and has given us light, we pray that the light of your word will dwell within our hearts, within our spirits, within our souls, so that we can praise your name in order to establish the truth that was from the very beginning, and even before the beginning, because your truth is eternal. Father, be with us every step of the way, and for this service today, Lord, bless the singers, Bless the testimony of their witness. Bless those who pray. Bless those who have come here in the spirit of worship to gather together to yes, welcome Lord. the Holy Spirit into the house where it shall be a house of prayer for all people. Father, we just thank you. May the words of our mouths and the meditations of our heart be found acceptable in your sight. And may you bring healing and comfort and strength to all these mentioned, Father, any others that we have not mentioned, Lord, you know them. Lord, just be a light of salvation unto us this day. Be the God of healing, Father. Jehovah Rapha, the God of healing. May that healing just take hold within our spirits and bring us to the holy place, the most holy place, Father, where all those prayers are kept in the storehouse of your memory. We thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Bless the Lord. Well, thank the Lord. I'm guessing the pilot, airplane pilots are denominational Trinitarian. <laughs> Ought to be in church Amen. instead of flying around. But you know, if he lands it in the parking lot and comes on in, okay. All right. Well, bless the Lord. Bless Amen. the Lord, oh my soul. Let's just bless his holy name by singing surely goodness and mercy, shall we? Yeah. Amen. This Amen. Morning. Brothers and sisters. Surely good. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days, all the days of my life. Surely goodness.
thank the Lord for his goodness this day. Amen. We're going to bow our heads and pray as we dedicate this service to the Almighty God. Thank Sister you, Meg, would you choose a song for us? Amen. Coming out of prayer, we're going to sing that. As I'll call Brother Jim if he'd come forward. Brother Jim's going to give us a prayer. Amen. Here. And we just thank the Lord for all that he is to yes, us this thank day. You, Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, this morning, Father, that we uh, can come, Lord, and worship you, Lord Jesus Christ. And thanking you, Father, for being in our lives and guiding us, Lord Jesus Christ, and being a lamp to our feet. We just thank you, Father, for your mercy and your grace, Lord Jesus Christ, and your blessings that you bestow upon your children. We ask you to bless this offering now, Lord Jesus Christ, that can be used for the furtherance of your kingdom, Lord, Father, God. And we just thank you, Lord Jesus Christ. We ask you to bless Brother Ryan here. Many full, Father, for taking the time and bringing forth your word, Lord, just so that we can perceive and hear what you have for us this day. So we thank you, Father, for all those who are sick and afflicted. We pray, Father God, that you touch them and bless them, Lord Jesus Christ, and set them free. So we thank you, Father, most of all, for that word, Lord Jesus Christ, that we have to look forward to. Yes, Lord. So we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank, the Lord. Thank you, Brother Jim. Amen. Thank the Lord. Let's give him an offering of praise. You know, I'm almost tempted to call for I'll fly away. You know, it all, oh, that just occurred to me, you know. So, so amen. All right. Well, bless the Lord. Amen. But we're going to take, we're going to sing the song that Sister Meg has for us, which is? Shout to the Lord. Shout to the Lord. Amen. Thank the Lord. Lord of the earth, let us sing. Power and majesty, praise to the King. Mountains bow down as the seas roar at the sound of your name. I sing for joy at the work of your hands. Forever I love you, forever I love you. Shout to the Lord. Amen. All the earth, let his praises ring. Amen. You may be seated this time as Brother Bill comes forward. Amen. Thank the Lord for the selections, amen, that are spirit-filled and God-given in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Bill. God bless Brother Ryan. God bless everyone this morning. We'll get right into the first selection, which is sweeter as the days go by. Good from me, he'll deny. The longer I know him, 
the better I could show him. I couldn't stop now if I tried. Oh, it gets the weed as the days, as the days go by. His good grace he gave me, he placed his love down deep in my heart. There's great joy in knowing, with him I am going, and never more from him to depart. Oh, it gets sweeter, sweeter as, the days as the days go by. As the days go by. It gets sweeter, sweeter as the moments fly. Deeper, deeper, sweeter, 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 sweeter as the days go by. Oh, it gets sweeter as the days go by. It gets sweeter as the moments fly. His love is richer, deeper, fuller, sweeter, 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 sweeter as the days go by. Oh, it gets sweeter as the days go by. Sister Miriam and brothers. For our next selection, Sister Margo will sing, Do All to Stand. In him we are made free, 
For the seed shall be prosperous, and the vine shall give her fruit. The ground shall give her increase, and the heavens shall give their due. And I will cause the remnant to possess all these things. It's thus saith the Lord, my friend, the time is now at hand. So do all to stand, to stand before the Lord. He is our righteousness. In him we are made free, free from this world of sin and death, free from the flesh and all its lusts, free from the bondage of devils all about, free by the grace of Jesus Christ our God. Well, that's free. God bless this one. Thank the Lord. Amen. God bless you, Sister Margot. For our last selection, how can I keep from singing? And it 
God bless you, brothers and sister Miriam. And if we'll all stand before Pastor Ryan comes to bring forth the word of truth unto us, we will sing the whole song to hold to God's unchanging hand, which is on page 200 in the green book. Sister Miriam plays through us. Just bow our heads and seek unto our God and Savior. Father, we thank you, dear Lord, for your eternal presence to be here this, with us this day. May the God of salvation, who speaks peace into our spirits, go with us in each and every step that we take. And Lord, today, Father, in this service, may the word be evident 
Father, may it proclaim its holiness to each and every spirit, to each and every faithful listener. Lord, may they be highly blessed in Jesus' name, who partake of these words of life that you have for us. So, Father, as we go onward in our earthly pilgrimage, Father, we pray that each and every one counts their blessings and indeed holds on to God's unchanging hands. And Father, we thank you, dear Lord, for all these things. In the precious name of Jesus, we give you all the glory, honor, and praise. In that blessed name, we do pray. Amen. amen. And amen. Praise the Lord. Well, thank the Lord. God bless the faithful. Thank you. Brothers and sisters, make their way out. You may be seated. Well, bless the Lord on high. You might have noticed I chortled a little bit when they started singing. Things get sweeter as the days go by. I was, the lyric occurred to me, the days get sweeter as the crop duster flies by, but you know, thank the Lord. So I uh, pray we don't get buzzed too much for the rest of the day. But, uh, with that, but that's one of the things when you have a church out in the middle of the cornfields, that such things will ha occur on, a, on occasion. But amen, the word of God goes forth. Amen. amen. So today, the Lord be magnified with high praises as our God has blessed us with the gift of life. Amen. And that has all to do with our sermon title this day. As everything being in God's hands, there certainly is a struggle going on. There is a, a fight, a real fight, uh, but it's a good fight for it teaches us how to use our weaponry, our spiritual weaponry, the armaments of our faith to quench all the fiery darts of the enemy as well as putting to use all the other uh, things of the spirit, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness and the truth always being our covering garment, feet shod with the gospel of peace, uh, we need those to uphold us, especially in these days of trial and, and the, the testing of the world, you know, so much violence, so many weather conditions, you know, and the, and the time of pestilence. Again, it, it, even if it isn't actually Matthew 24 upon us, it, it sure makes you think about that. So you got to consider all these things, be aware of the signs of the times, of the day and age that we're living in. It's always a call to repentance. It's always a call to get closer to God. It's all these things. And then always upholding the sword of the Spirit, which the Word of God is, we just go on in His name. Knowing that God is as good as His Word. Yeah. And indeed, He is His Word. St. John chapter 1, verse 14. As the Word was made flesh to dwell among us. Because God is, in all actuality, He is truth. And his desire was to bring forth spiritual children created in his image. Thus he becomes to us a witness of life, which we'll take for our subject this morning. And we'll just concentrate on this thought, a witness of life. Is this sermon inspired by some of the, the truths that are written in the closing scriptures of the book of Job? And we'll come to it in the second portion of our service. We have some things first to lead up to that. But uh, encompassing some of the comments I made back in the midweek in the video cast back on June 3rd of this year, at that time I mentioned that I would most likely put some of those things into a pulpit form under this title, and so we come to it today. So if you want to look back and just reference that uh, midweek uh, up, upload, you can do so. Uh, but this is a, a result of those thoughts and what I uh, said there at that time. So we're talking about life today. We're talking about life itself and the faith implanted within. And that's the gift of God. That's a gift that he has bestowed us all with. And so said Paul in his speaking upon Mars Hill in Acts chapter 17 and verse 28. For it's in him we live and move and have our being. And there's nothing apart from that. And out of one act of creation, out of one blood, he's made all nations of mankind for to dwell upon the face of the earth. There in the opening chapter of Genesis 1, 
that starts our story off of physical creation. In Genesis 1 chapter, or, or Genesis 1 verse 20 rather, Jehovah God put a process of life into the waters, and then the waters brought forth abundantly. God did that. There's a process of life built into this earthly creation, and secular science may attribute that to random chance of mutation and so forth that leads to evolution, but even with life coming forth out of the waters, God is the one who put that into place. He set it in place, and thus it is, because God is the greatest scientist ever. He's the one that has all the answer, answers. He's the one that has all the facts. And then as the creation story unfolds, uh, as following plant life and animal life begin to flourish, life begins to replenish the earth, and in due course he put the breath of life into Adam. And the man became a living soul, and here we are. We're a result of all that that God put in place, and it's breathtaking. It's, it's a wonder how God has put everything all in cre of creation into those, I believe there's 31 verses in the opening chapter of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1. And then it's so succinctly put in St. John chapter 1 in the first five verses, which comprise a type of Genesis of the New Testament account, where the Word was made flesh, to be born amongst us. And apart from that, and because of that fact, nothing else is existent. It's a beautiful truth. It shows us the power of creation, such as it was in the beginning, when the morning stars sang and the sons of God shouted for joy. The worship service at the dawn of time. What a privilege it is. What a privilege our spiritual inheritance is to know that there was a place for us in the heart and mind of Almighty God and a place put forth and a plan set in order before the birth of time even in the limitless wisdom that God was that Proverbs chapter 8 speaks about which is a history of knowledge itself and an accounting of wisdom as it was that we were in his thoughts before the worlds were framed by the word of God, before the energy of creation was set free at God's behest, as God spoke it forth and then it was. And I am in awe of that fact. I speak to it a lot from behind the pulpit and, and so forth because it is truly amazing what God has done and the miracle of it all that we see around us. As our God, is an awesome God. Yeah. Amen. And the splendor of what he has done gives testimony to all that he is. The living, expressive wisdom that thought, therefore, I am. The great I am rules our lives. Let's go to the book of Revelation to start in Scripture. Revelation chapter 1. The task at hand, there's so much to know. It never, the Bible, again, of things that never cease to amaze me, the Bible itself, there's always more to learn, there's always more to take a hold of and to draw spiritual strength from, but the elements of our faith remain beautifully simple. Love God, love one another. Just, that, just those core beliefs that we have, amen, they're the foundation point for all other things that we believe in, from the major points of doctrine uh, to the minor points of doctor and even the, the nuances of his historical interpretation and, and uh, interpretation of doctrines and so forth. But they all rest upon those. And you can know that in just the time it took me to say that. You can get the essentials of our faith. And then with the heart you believe and confessions made unto salvation, and there you are. You're a Christian when you know the name of Jesus. Amen. Just that quickly. But uh, to be perfected and to gain knowledge and to gain truth, which is God's desire for us, it takes a lifetime, and I'm sure not at the end of it yet. I don't know how many days I have left, but uh, I'm not going to run out of scriptures, amen, to reach that point. I know that. Whether that's today or 10 years from now or 20 years now, uh, from now, I, I don't know. But I know that God has a limitless supply of things that he wants to show you. Amen. I know that. And I know love covers a multitude, covers a multitude of sins as it did there 
at Golgotha upon the cross of suffering and shame. And love is so much more than just a concept, it is that, but love is also an armament because love defeats deception. Whatever deceiving spirit is out there, if you love the Lord and you love one another, you can beat anything yeah. in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. God put love at the top of the list of virtues, as to, uh, and it's, it's so very hard to imitate. It can be uh, glossed over for a while, and, and people will put a mask over themselves and so forth, uh, like Judas Iscariot did. It, it, uh, for a short time, that can be done. But in the end, it will always show itself because love's a higher plane. You got to have it within your spirit. It's not just being right about names, dates, and places, or even prophecies, because that's, that's Christianity 101. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If I had understanding of all mysteries, I'm nothing without Christian charity, which love is. So all those things are set in place from the Almighty for a reason. And here we read from the book of Revelation, from the first verse. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. Not in immediacy of years, or 2,000 years for the greater part, 1,900 years plus, uh, from uh, this writing by John the Apostle. But God will bring them about shortly, when all things are in, in place. It has to have a sense of immediacy for those that are alive at the time when... Uh, it's the time of to and fro, when it's the time of judgment in the Valley of Megiddo and all these things. And besides that, we have to see things from an eternal perspective, from God's perspective, because time is relative, and time being relative, as it shows in Psalms chapter 90 and verse 4, it shows in 2 Peter chapter, chapter 3 and verse 8, shows those things, time being relative. This is God's relativity of time, says this is a blink of an eye to the eternal one. So we have to learn to see things through God's eyes. All right? So shortly to come to pass, and he sent and signified it by his angel, or by his own Holy Spirit, unto his servant John, John the Apostle Revelator, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ. And that, that phrase, it's interwoven throughout the scriptures, shows people of faith of the Old Testament, they have the word of God, but they do not have the testimony of Jesus. We're looking to put those two things together. Like John did when he wrote it out in Revelation. That's why we've got the Star of David as a witness over there. The cross is higher. It's, the cross is what we look to. But we look to the day when the church and the synagogue will come together in blessed union. And oh, what a day. That's going to be. It's Romans chapter 11. It'll tell you everything you need to know about that. Has God forsaken his people? He's true to his promises. Nonetheless, we're separated for the best part of 2,000 years over the question of who Jesus was. One day that wound will be healed in Jesus' name. We pray that uh, we're a part of it. Amen. We are a part of it as we speak about these things today. All right. So having witness of all these things that he saw, we go on to verse 3. Blessed is he that readeth. Why are we reading this? I want you to be blessed. God wants you to be blessed. Yeah. You, the, the book doesn't bless you unless you open it. It's, got, it, it's not a paperweight. It's something to, to be used. Amen. Thank the Lord. For, for your good to instruct you in the ways of life and get you somewhere worth going. So blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein. For the time is at hand. Again, that level of uh, immediacy. Verse 4 then. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, which will be so named in chapters 2 and 3. Grace be unto you in peace from him which is and which was and which is to come. Oh, I love that. I love that. As God covers all points of existence, past, present, and future. Covers all points in time, just as well as geography and, and space and, and, and all those things, God is there. And for, so to, for, to he which was and is to, is to come, always is, ever present, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, which witness in the messages of the seven church ages, 
and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in, in his own blood. He's the faithful witness, which verse 5 was what I was pointing to, but boy, what a way to set up verse 5 by reading those first four verses. Amen. The word of God just speaks to us. So get the book open. Share it together. You know what? Life is better when you share it with somebody else. The word of God is better when you share it with others. So that's what, that's what we do here. Amen. And this is life. When you share life with others, amen, thank the Lord, it gets better. It gets better. Uh, trials will come, but nonetheless, in Jesus, <clears throat> it, it is so that the days will get sweeter as they go by. As God is the faithful witness. And what does he witness? He witnesses truth. Yes. Historical, doctrinal, prophetic truth. Amen. And within those things, he is the witness of life. For that, this gives awareness to our spirit that dwells within. As life exists because of him, and without him there would be nothing. And the life of Jesus is... It is a faithful witness and an embodiment of infinite truth. As Christ himself, he led a life that was a, a testament to being separate to the world, even as he walked amongst his own in the world. As he walked along, he being the resurrection himself, described here as the, as we read out of uh, the first chapter here, described as the first begotten of the dead. And that's a witness of life. That is a witness of his life. And that by speaking that word of life and all that comes with it, what does God care about? What subject did Jesus speak the most about? If you just make it a theological point to study what it is that the master talked most about, what he taught most about, what everything pertained to in those red letter words of his earthly witness to us, what did he talk about? He talked about life. He talked about life and how precious it is. It showed in all his actions. It showed in everything that he said. It showed at the tomb of Lazarus as those two words which are so instructive of who the master was in that Jesus wept. Amen. It was about life. And he talked about all that was there as a that pertained to conscious thought and expression, and all that he did was uh, meant to sustain precious life. And all that the devil does is meant to destroy it. So this is a fight we're in. So in this fight, be a soldier. Fight back with faith, amen, by, with, with love of God, with love of one another. Fight back by the faith that works by love. For indeed, when you resist the devil, he will flee. Because this is the truth that ever was from the start of all things. While we're here in Revelation 1, I want to pick it up now at verse 13. Verse 13. Well, actually, let's read from verse 12 and read on. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. Again, that voice had substance. You listen to voices, right? You don't see them. But this voice had vision to it. This voice had substance. It was as real as anything that there is. He turned, I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. In, a, in the, the way that that was in, in that day, we have a representation of it. That's our liberty banner that's up behind me and above me. The liberty banner represents that. The seven churches, the seven candlesticks that are shown by representation here. So that's what that means. So I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, or in the midst of the church, uh, metaphorically speaking, one like unto the Son of Man, which describes Jesus 70 times in Scripture, mostly by the Master himself, here by John the Apostle Revelator. Described as the Son of Man. That's his way to identify with us, with his creation, with the Adam's race. So one like unto Jesus, even as John walked with him and talked with him in his earthly witness, was present there at the, uh, 
the sacrifice of the cross, one like unto the Son of Man. But this is shown by vision to be uh, more glorious. Jesus, when he walked this earth, he just looked like an ordinary person. But here he is in such visage, such spiritual visage, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paths with a golden girdle or, or a sash, gold, like a golden sash. His, hairs and, his head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, which is always reflective of righteousness within. It's an outward sign of an inward righteousness. And his eyes were as a flame of fire, because they see. And they get right down to the heart of the matter. Our God is a consuming fire. Amen. It'll get down to the truth of who you are. It'll get down to the truth of any subject. And his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace. And his voice is the sound of many waters, which helps to represent all those who are in agreement. But when God speaks, he does so with the amens and the praises of his people in mind, which waters often represents within scripture the nations, kindreds, and tongues of the earth. So God speaks, and that's intermingled with the praises of his people who are in agreement with him. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, which is, of course, the word of God, seven stars being the messengers and, and the standard bearers of the day who would bring forth his will. And his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. Amen. Seven stars, then representing the messengers, the seven churches there in verse 20, the candlesticks of Verse 13, verse 12, it's, a, it's our liberty banner, represents that. The, the churches in, that God spoke to there by his spirit, and it comprises the, first, uh, the second and third chapter of the book of Revelation. So what did John do when we look at these scriptures? He fell at the Lord's feet as one who was dead. But in fact, the witness given to John is, I am he that liveth. God makes you alive, even if you think you're dead. <laughs> Can you imagine how John felt right at that moment? I fell down like one dead. He just overwhelmed by the power of the vision. Hallelujah. Fell down like that. And certainly uh, there's just cause for that, because certainly I have the keys of hell and death. That's true. I hold the power over the cessation of life. But the victory is in the power over the grave. For I am life itself. Now, could anything speak more to who God is than this? He laid his right hand upon me. Think about that. Think of it. In the Exodus, remember how it was in the Exodus? Now, God will speak in different voices at different times according to the nature of, of the progression of things, and it fits his purpose. But it was all to bring us to the life of Christ. But remember on the mountain, when the law was given, where the mountain fire and smoke was all over it. Don't come near the mountain. Don't even come near me. God's holiness is so great. But here it comes down to this moment. The Almighty in this vision, one like the Son of a Man, the Son of Man rather, reaches out and touches John. And perhaps the most tender and daring moment of Scripture ever the everlasting, eternal God reaches out to touch the disciple. And he's reaching out to touch you right now through the words of this scripture. That it was meant, that's what it was meant to do. So everything when God spoke upon the mountain and all the fire and the smoke and don't come near to the presence of my holiness, but where did it get us to? It got us to this moment, didn't it? Where he could reach out and touch us. Where he could walk by and we could touch the hem of his garment. That's where it all led to, didn't it? People have a hard time sometimes equating the God of the Old Testament with Jesus Christ of the New and how all these things work. You just got to see things from a different viewpoint. You got to see things from the top of the mountain by faith. Amen. 
So his eyes are like a flame of fire, consuming all that will not stand, but purifying and cleansing everything that will stand in Jesus' name. Amen. And so he reaches out to John, and by extension to us who received John's witness, you're blessed if you read the words of this book. It's all designed for not just for one person only, but for all those of faith. All those who shall believe on me, as, as Jesus spoke of. So there's life in there. I fell at my feet as dead, but here's the one who liveth forevermore to reach out and touch. John the Apostle. There's life in there in these blessed sayings. And in the fire of God's eyes who see beyond, above and beyond, all things. Let's turn to John's witness in St. John. This will be from chapter 6. When you see through God's eyes, when you see through the refining fire, that purges all things, well, then you're seeing something. That's, that's better than, Mount Zion is better than Mount Rushmore. That's a, quite a theological statement, isn't it? Amen. A lot of people drive to Mount Rushmore because they think they're going to see something. And it is pretty neat to see a bunch of that big carving presence there on Mount Rushmore. But Mount Zion is greater than that. Amen. Thank the Lord. This is the mountain to see. The Mount of Zion where all blessings flow. Amen. It's above and beyond the temporal things of this world. Mount Rushmore will pass away. Mount Zion will live forevermore in the new heavens and the new earth that is to come. So learn to see through God's eyes, and that takes revelation sight by the power of what is written within these scriptures. Now in John chapter 6 here, sometimes I get to talk and forget to turn the pages. John chapter 6, verse 47, and read about life is contained here, verily, verily, or absolutely, absolutely, Pay attention to this. I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Thanks. Believe on him. Thanks. That's not so tough, is it? Just believe on the Lord. And do things according to what he says. You have everlasting life. I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. Because, now, we're talking about life eternal here. What Jesus is talking about, of course, because the ones he was speaking to, uh, they saw it as a, a natural senses statement, because Jesus said, I'm the bread of life, because, because it's spiritually meant here. The fathers ate bread in, in the wilderness, the manna from heaven, and are dead. So don't, don't just look at physical things, look at spiritual things. All right. So, uh, it, uh, and I have no doubt that he uh, phrased it so, the master did for that very purpose, to stress the importance of the wisdom imparted. Truly, truly, absolutely, absolutely, verily, verily. All right, so I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat man in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die, because this is, this is spiritual life, not, doesn't just sustain the body, but it sustains the soul. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. What did Jesus talk about? If you're going to put one word to it, uh, there, there, he, he spoke about love. He spoke about many things could, could help def, uh, define an answer to that question. But he spoke about life. He spoke about life. That's what he was concerned with. The, that life would be flourishing and abundant as it was created there in the beginning to, in order to spread out over the face of the earth. He believed in life. So he spoke it forth as a, belief is life. Sometimes we sing only believe, all things are possible. If we sang only have, have life, it would essentially mean the same thing. Only have life, because if you have life, then you are believing, because that's, a, that's an eternal thing, and it's the eternal gift of God. The meaning would be the same. So to have life of the eternal sort is to believe. So here we have the enduring substance of the bread of life, for the words sustain our being. A very simple precept is put forth. 
Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth yeah. of God, which is what this, <clears throat> excuse me, bread of life is. And two chapters back in the book of St. John in chapter 4 and verse 10, the analogy there is living water to the Samaritan woman, as you recall the instance, at Jacob's well. For water sustains life even as bread does. So uh, all the comparisons, they all come together in Jesus' name. One king who has many crowns, he has many ways <clears throat> to describe truth. And when we think about that, why does God hate lies? Let's just think upon that for a second. Why does God hate lies? Because, well, obviously they're not true and all, all the things that can be said of that. But think of it in this way. Lies are not eternal. They have a beginning, and they certainly have an end. But truth is always there. Truth is what makes it possible for God to exist, because truth does exist, and thus God exists, because truth is eternal. Without truth, God himself cannot exist. He is the embodiment of all things that are true, and thus we seek unto him. Yeah. Lies can't do that. So why would God love lies when they're just temporary things that get in the way of that which is eternal. That's why lies have to be swept aside. Only truth is eternal. There's no, be there's no beginning to truth, just like a, the example I've used a lot of late, the mathematical equation. There's a process that's true and there's a result that's true. Addition is the process, one plus one, one, plus one equals two. That's eternal, because you can't get back to a time where that started. It's an eternal truth. God is the embodiment of eternal truth that always was, because there was no beginning and no end. And because truth exists, God had to exist, because truth has to have a voice, and that's who God is. And I think that's fantastic. I think that's the reason why I live and draw breath and speak from behind this pulpit right here at this moment. God exists because truth is eternal. You can't get back to a time where God was not. But lies, they're temporal. They have a starting place and they will have an end in Jesus' name. And anything not of the truth will not exist. All right. So here, written within this statement in St. John chapter 6, it's a model of clarity and simplicity. Believe on me and life is the result. That's what Jesus cared about was life. Verse 49 there, don't put your trust in physical things alone. That sustained that type of manna bread. It sustained them in the wilderness for a few years. But this is the type of stuff that will make you to live forever. And salvation, the God of our salvation, it's not by works. But it's by belief, because that's what the, those that are justified in Jesus' name, they do. The just shall live by faith. And that's the Abrahamic principle that Paul expounded upon, Romans chapter 1, verse 17. It's by that that we live. It's not by law observance. And God hasn't placed anything before us that's so very hard. As we often quote Micah 6, 8, but let's, uh, I'm not going to read it directly here, I'll just quote it, but take note. When you read Micah 6, 8, take a minute, uh, just a few seconds to read Micah chapter 6 and verse 7 as well, because it, it says, what, what's going to justify me in God's sight? All the, all the elements of religion. Now the law and the sacrifices, it was all put in place to be a schoolmaster to get us Christ, but that wasn't the point. That wasn't the point. It was just a vehicle to get us to the time of Christ. So will thousands of sacrifices do it? Will that please the old man? If I give thousands of rams or thousands of rivers of anointing oil, or, or then it even, verse 7 even continues on with that, shall I give my firstborn as, as child sacrifice? You know, that was a prevalent idea in those Canaanite civilizations that God had to drive them out of the land because of their iniquities. That practice child sacrifice, shall I give my firstborn for... Uh, transgression, all these things. God isn't found in just acts of religion. He's found within the precepts of faith. And the just shall live by that faith. 
not just by acts of religion, or not just by church membership, but by only believe, only believe, and then all things are possible. And all virtues worthy of praise reflect that thought. All right, now let's turn to the book of Job, which I mentioned up, up front in the scripture, amen. We're gonna to look to example of the book of Job, the closing scriptures of the witness of the patriarch Job. Thank the Lord for that which has life in it. We thank the Lord, the Psalms, as we're turning to John 42, just think on this while we're doing that. 23rd Psalm, you know when we usually read that. It's at a time of someone's passing away is offered in comfort. But the 23rd Psalm is God's word is a book of life. And the 23rd Psalm has a witness of life contained with it because even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, well, if you're walking, that's an act of life, isn't it? Yeah. The walking is life, so amen. Yeah. So if we walk according to his word, amen, we have life. So do that, no matter what trials you face. And here, just to briefly, briefly summarize the book of Job, you have sufficient knowledge of it to lead us up to the closing scriptures. But in the tests and trials that took a hold of Job and in and his agony and all his thoughts in this ancient example of the book of Job, we'll find something extraordinary contained within. After all the loss of his family and possessions and, and his health and all the words that uh, were of absolutely no comfort that were given to him uh, by his three friends, here we come to Job chapter 42, and taking all those things into consideration, uh, Job prayed for uh, those who hadn't spoke the right thing. And then we come to verse 10, which shows God's mercy there. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job. All that, he turned the whole situation around. All, everything that came upon him. When he prayed for his friends, also the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Because then when you go into the first chapter and second chapter of Job, you see he had a, a amount of uh, sheep and, and cam, uh, camels, uh, the, the riches of the day, the standard of riches as, as it was. He was very well to do. But God gave him twice as much as he had before. All right, verse 11. Then came there unto him all his brethren and all his sisters and all they that had been of his acquaintance before and did eat bread with him in his house. And they bemoaned him and comforted him over all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. Now, again, it looks very stark when you read it out of Scripture. This, as you know, from the first and second chapters of Job, uh, it, this just means the evil that came upon him, the Lord allowed it to be so when you take all the Scriptures in. It wasn't just God just, hey, I didn't get up one morning and say, hey, I'm going to mess with Job. There's a reason for all this, and the reason that it came forth and is put into writing is our example so that we can learn from this the top end of suffering so that we can apply it to our own day and, and thus it is that God's grace is sufficient to meet the test in every trial. So the book of Job teaches us that. So uh, every purpose uh, under heaven comes to uh, us through the word of God and there's purpose in that. All right, so the Lord allowed it to be so. All right. Every man also gave him a piece of money and every one an earring of gold. So the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning. For he had 14,000 sheep. Whereas you go in the first chapter, he had, when he talks about his substance, he had 7,000. So here's double the blessing. It's a double portion of what he had before. And 6,000 camels. Whereas at the start, before his sufferings, he had 3,000, so the number is double. He's getting double blessings here. And 1,000 yoke of oxen, because he had, from the account, we learned that he had 500, so it's double once again. And 1,000 she-asses, for he had half that number. So this is all the livestock, made him very wealthy. He had a double portion of all that he had. And of course, in a larger study, we'd read those scriptures too. I decided to just summarize it, to put it all in, in one service. So he got blessed in all these things, where he had twice as much as he had before. Now here's where you have to have your spiritual perspective on high alert as we read this. Verse 13, he had also seven sons and three daughters. Now, 
We have to pay attention to this because at the beginning of it, again, we didn't read it directly, but he has seven sons and three daughters. So here you would think they're just replaced, but that's where we draw our title from, a witness of life. We've got to see things through God's eyes, and we'll get to that. All right, but first we'll read the following verse, which is verse 14. And he names his daughters, and he called the name of the first Jemima. Now, and I'll go through an explanation of names here in just a moment. And the name of the second, Keziah, and the name of the third, Karen Hapa. And of course, after all these things, Job lived out his days in, in peace. All right, this is where we have to see with vision beyond natural senses. Now, I hadn't paid a lot of attention to these scriptures, but a question that uh, a brother down in Bloomington, which happened to be Brother Kelvin, uh, asked me. It, it, I was curious about those things. I didn't know. I couldn't give him a direct answer at the time, but I, I went and looked this up, and, and I did some homework on it. And I believe the stages of the Lord's restoration are found in the names of his daughters that represent Job's night being turned to day. In the name of Jemima, the bitterness of his calamity had now become sweetness. In Keziah, and God had imparted revelation knowledge. So uh, Jemima, the bitterness uh, uh, of all those things. It was found in the name of Keziah and Jemima's name so that his light would be turned today. And God had imparted revelation knowledge which shows in the name of Karen Havoc, which Brother Kelvin just, we spoke there and he brought up that in, a, in discussion which got me thinking about uh, this particular subject. So God reveals himself. There's three daughters named. God uses math. Why does God use math? Because it's true. Just like in our aforementioned example of the mathematical equation, God uses numbers because they're true and they're eternal, and these names reflect the fact that the Lord's nature is to show himself to his own, because that's how he reveals himself. So if you look up the names and the meanings of the names of the daughters of Job, uh, you'll find a lot of definitions. You kind of have to sort through things, but uh, for the most part, I've used Jewish sources, to determine this more than those translations of, uh, from Christian scholars and of, of the names and the, their origins, uh, because definitions are almost as diverse as translations of the scripture itself. Uh, things get interpreted in different ways, so uh, I usually prefer Jewish sources more than, uh, more than others that come from Gentile sources. Thus, Jemima means night turned to day. And Keziah translates as cinnamon, or sweetness, at the least. And Karen Hapak is defined as a ray of light through a precious stone, or emerald. It reflects Job's night being turned to day. It tells him that things were getting sweeter as the days go by. Amen. Amen. And the precious light shows like as it does through an emerald. Now, that's revelation light coming to Job to be his comfort after his time of trial. And he sees things differently now because of the knowledge of God's wisdom which has been imparted unto him. And note this witness of life within the scripture. I alluded to it earlier. But Job's second family has seven sons and three daughters, the same number as his first family. All the other, all the livestock numbers, they're all double. But when it comes to sons and daughters, he had three daughters, he had seven sons. Now they are replaced, not doubled numerically, but he has the same and the like number as the first family that perished. And all the other substance of his house, they were multiplied twofold. He had 7,000 sheep at the beginning. Job chapter 1, verse 3, again, it's always instructive to read the whole account. We'll just refer to it for the time being. So he had 7,000 sheep, now he has 14,000. He had 3,000 camels, now he has 6,000, etc. But when it came to his restored family, a surface, a surface judgment would say, well, God missed out on this one. He made a mistake here because his sons and daughters were only replaced, not doubled. But here's the witness of life and what the, all these spiritual things we've talked about, here's what it's all leading to. His children before the afflictions are still alive. 
Their souls haven't perished. He still has them. He still got them. This is where you got to see through God's sight. Because then, if you just look through it through worldly eyes, you say, ah, see, God messed up. He didn't double his blessings. But those souls are existent. He still has them. Yes. They've passed beyond the veil of tears. They've walked through the valley of the shadow of death. They've passed from this level of existence true. The flesh has seen corruption of decay. But their souls are with the giver of all blessings. That's where you got to see through God's eyes. So Job has 20 children, double the number of chapter 1, in the Lord's eyes, because souls that God put the breath of life into, those are existent. They're with the Almighty. They're still there, even though there's a great gulf fixed between, but they're still there, whereas animal creation not necessarily uh, so. So there's a difference between the human creation and the animal kingdom. You have to see through the Lord's eyes to see the double blessing. Not through an outlook that only comes from this earth only. This is a different outlook. It's a different way of life. As the human soul is different. It was made to be different. It was fashioned different. It was made to be in the image that God would have it to be. As a, a living, expressive and perfectly truthful, that's been part of the conflict ever since uh, sin nature got in, in the door in the Garden of Eden. But it's meant to be all those things in its perfect state. It's, it's something that is above and beyond this earth. Let's turn to Psalms 27. God sees things in ways that humankind does not. And you have to see that in order to see the double portion that Job received and how restoration works. We have to see it from the other side. And from the other side of the curtain of time, you could see that. We have to see it by faith. It's there. You have to look through God's eyes in these things, not just the temporal things of this world. You've got to see with the vision of he who was and is and is to come in order to see things with eternal clarity. His ways are higher than man's. His thoughts, his insights are deeper. They go beyond the average. They go beyond surface judgments that people make and reach under the heights of the clouds. That's the stuff that will get you to the top of Mount Zion. He's the creator God who spoke to Abraham and promised him life to come that would proceed from his own body and that of Sarah. It looked like they were dead in that respect, that the seed of life could not procreate, but as it turned out, you got to see things through God's eyes there, too. He turned back the clock. God does miracles. The Bible starts with a miracle, and miracles never cease. And a miracle was put in place there, not only as to show what God can do and to show that there are no impossibilities. It, it is that. It's all of that and more. But it's also this. The birth of Christ comes down from that line. And without that birth, you couldn't have the genealogy that leads to Christ. So all those things were put in place to do what? To get Christ here. To get him born. To get him born in Bethlehem and bring forth. That put that all into place. God did something impossible in order to bring about our salvation through the name of Jesus. Got to see through God's eyes. And Jesus of Nazareth, and as in that the word became flesh to dwell among us, as Jesus of Nazareth, the very uh, born in Bethlehem, but the very messenger of the covenant bodily, the master told them in Matthew chapter 22 and verse 32, that the God who talked to Moses, remember this as a witness of life, the God who talked to Moses, he said, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as living souls, which Jesus uh, stressed that within the speaking of those scriptures as we read them out. I'm not the God of the dead. I'm the God of the living. I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They're still alive. They're still alive. Yeah, they're on the other side of the curtain of time. The body's moldering in the, in the grave, but there's, you got to see things through God's eyes. He's not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living in the present tense, alive, alive. The account of the rich man and Lazarus, not he who rose from the grave, but 
uh, the account of the rich man Lazarus that Jesus used, for example, now had comfort. Uh, he was in uh, term, what was termed Abraham's bosom. That verifies that precept. It shows awareness beyond the grave. It shows that there's life to come beyond the curtain of time. It even shows at the moment, the very moment when sin nature came into, the, into play, when Cain took up uh, a stone, if, if stone it was indeed, uh, probably, it might have had some type of farming implement, whatever it was, but he rose up in the field and slew his brother Abel. Now that, that's a heinous crime. It shows how iniquity got in and how the devil put a virus into the seed of humanity in order to bring death to it. But even then, Abel's blood cried up from the ground. So even through that, there's a witness of life that shows itself in the scripture, even out of that treacherous act of murderous intent. There's a witness of life sewn into the fabric of all these scriptures. Abel's blood cried out from the ground. There's something more. There's something more. There's something you've got to be aware of in Jesus' name. And it all speaks to existence beyond natural means, as we know it. There can be natural laws that God's put in place that are undiscovered. All that, that can be true. But uh, thank the Lord they exist in God's sight, and God does that which is deemed impossible by man. And it's testimony of the truth that lives within these scriptures. Now here we are in Psalms 27. As the power of the third day makes us alive unto God, those things that Hosea the prophet spoke of in chapter 6 and verse 2, came to life within the testimony of Jesus, which became the spirit of prophecy that we live by, and it lives today. What did Jesus speak about? Everything was about life. You show me something that Jesus spoke about, and I guarantee you there's life within that. Amen. He spoke about life. So don't listen to the disciples of death, you know, like atheists, you know, and agnostics that are just God-haters in disguise and all those things. Everything they tell you leads to death. It doesn't have any truth living in it. It's a lie which they may believe to one extent or another. Let's see how much they believe it when they get in a foxhole. Don't find too many atheists there, do you, when it comes down to it? Maybe some of them will become like the thief on the cross next to Christ who in the last moment of his life said, when you come into your kingdom, remember me. Yeah. Maybe there will be, be a few converts, and there are along the way. But, so we thank God for his mercy that makes that so. Amen. After all, that's who Jesus died for, right? The sinner and the ungodly, the unbeliever. Amen. So we pray that that will be so. But for those that expound on those opinions and think they're oh so very wise, they're just disciples of death. And that will pass away. But the word of God, it will abide forever. Amen. Amen. All right, here in Psalms chapter 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Amen to that. The Lord is the strength of my life. There's that word again, life. Why did God create to bring forth life? Why did Jesus speak? to bring back life to the one that's dead. Of whom shall I be afraid? Even death. Do we have to fear death? Perfect love casts out all fear. Because perfect love's eternal. Death, had, it had a beginning, and it will have an end. It's the last enemy to be put off. Who should I be afraid of? When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes, come upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. And with King David, if you could be there to see every event in his life, we don't have it, every instance recorded, but there's enough. There's enough in there. You know, uh, when you were small, maybe you dreamed of being a king upon a throne and ruling a kingdom. Uh, careful what you wish for. Uh, you wouldn't want to be king and be in the, in the place of David. As much as uh, we read the Davidic scriptures and the covenant came through them and so forth, if you could be there to go through all the politics of the day and all the things that happened to him and the betrayal and the loneliness and, and everything, uh, you don't want to be put in that place. You don't want to be put in that place at all. And he experienced all those things. All right, verse 3, Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord 
all the days of my life. There's life. There's life within these scriptures. There's life in the beholding of it. To behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me upon a rock that cannot be moved. <clears throat> Thank the Lord. These words are about life. They're eternal. As we read about them in scripture, they're about 3,000 years old from the time of their inscribing, but they contain eternal thoughts. It, it feels good to take 3,000-year-old advice, doesn't it? Amen. Thank the Lord. Where are you getting your advice from? Amen. My advice is 2,000 years old in the words of Jesus. My advice is 3,000 years old. You know what? Uh, I give up. It goes all the way back to the, before the beginning of time. Because these truths are eternal. That's when they were expressed and written in Scripture, so we use those dates, which, which is well and good, and it, it speaks great things to us. But all these truths didn't have their start 2,000 years ago or 3,000 years ago. They've always been true. You can't get back to a time where these things that we speak of were not true. They are eternal. That's what makes them different from lies. So, amen. These tell us that the honest and reverent, awestruck fear of the Lord tendeth to life. To bless us in all ways and to teach us and guide us. Is this, this psalm shows forth the beauty of the Lord. Such majesty. Such royalty written within these words that are living bread, they're living water. All those statements. They sustain us. They deliver us from the power of the hurtful sword. They lift us up out of the pit. They put us upon the rock. They lift us up out of the miry clay. And our desire is to live in God's presence, reside in the holy house in Mount Zion's hills. That's our witness of life. That's our glory. And what a miracle life is. Without miracles, no life exists. And without truth, no miracles could exist. But here we are, out of nothing. And what's the only book? that told the scientific world that everything was created out of nothing, the Bible was the only one. None of the other ancient mythologies and, and written creation accounts, nobody came anywhere close. The Bible's the only book that said that. Hebrews 11.3 confirms it. Faith is a substance, things hoped for. God hoped for it and he spoke forth in that voice of truth. It had substance to it. And then it brought everything forth so that everything that we see around us was created out of things that are not seen. There's creation which has substance out of that which had no physical substance as we know it. But it was sure there. Faith was there. Non-physical, but it was there. And it made everything to exist. And without that, no life exists apart from that. Out of nothing. Existence sprang forth. Here in Psalms 27, while we're here, we're finished with verses 13 and 14. I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. It would have been too much for me. When the water flood would overflow me, I, I, would, have, I would have been swallowed up by it. I would not have survived the crashing waves of life's circumstances. I had fainted. Unless I had something within my heart, unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord and be alive at the same time. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. David wrote that not only for his own benefit, but for those who were alive at the time because it, the word of God's responsible to the generation it was written in and to each and every believer that came forth out of those foundation principles in the New Testament era, 500 years later, 1000 AD, 1500 AD, the time of the Reformation era, right up here we're in the 2000s. This advice has stood the test of time, the eternal test of time because it's true. We're here in the land of the living right now. Amen. Praise his holy name. Let's stand and pray. Yeah. Thank the Lord. Yeah. Having talked about life and the beauty of it,
and to inquire in his temple as brothers and sisters come forth. Be a good time for River of Life, I believe. Amen. Thank the Lord. Sister Mary will play through for us. There's a river of life. Let it flow on out from me. Amen. Not because it comes from any substance of our own making, but because the faithful have allowed the presence of the Almighty God to have a place within their spirit. And it flows ever outward from the throne of God. So we're going to sing River of Life and bow our heads in prayer and just thank the Lord as we behold his beauty. You've got to see things with different eyes to behold the fullness of his beauty. You've got to see things through eyes of faith, see things beyond the temporal things of this world, to get the full vision and the revelation of it. Because it's there, these words, they are the way, they are the life, and they are the truth. As we bow our heads and pray, Dear Lord, we just thank you for your eternal presence that cannot stand the presence of lies because they're only death. They're only temporal things, and they have to be swept out of the way. And Father, your word is like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. Father, your word is that crimson flood that gets all the stains out. Father, it delivers the truth to us in Jesus' name. How we thank you for this eternal truth, this wisdom that sustains us and here the days of our trial the time of our pilgrimage upon this earth. But we're getting to somewhere that's better in Jesus' name. We're on a heavenly pilgrimage, seeking a city that doesn't abide in temporary terms only, but one that lasts forever. The new Jerusalem and the new heavens, the new earth, and the kingdom which is to come, which is your kingdom, Father. May your will be done right now, here in our lives as it is done in heaven. Father, may our prayers just rise up. May everyone be of such heart that the light abounds in them, forgiving one another, even as our trespasses are forgiven concerning us. Father, we thank you for the life that you have given us. We thank you, dear Lord, for the precious gift of salvation that comes through faith in Jesus' name. And remembering those in prayer that we've mentioned here, Lord, just lift them up, be with them every step of the way, and bring the light of your presence to them. Bring healing, Father even if you, as you have promised to do so. Through the blessed name of Jesus, we give you all the glory and all praise and account you as sovereign and Lord of all. In the precious name of Jesus, we do pray. Amen. And amen. Well, thank the Lord. Amen. Thank the Lord for life and that eternal. There's a river of life. There's a river of life flowing out from me. He made the lame to walk and the blind to see. He opened the prison doors that the captives free. There's a river of life flowing out from me. There's a river of life flowing out from me. He made the lame to walk and the blind to see.